Hey, what's up everybody? How are you? My name is Russ with rwgresearch.com. Wow, lots going on and I'm excited about this one. Although I'm not feeling super prepared, so it probably won't be a super long video. However, let me write down the date. Today's date is 1-30-2018. 1-30-2018. That is really hard to see, but I think it shall be just peachy. All right, so the black is about dried out. We'll get some new markers. Um, all right, so this is the Search for Answers Part 15. If you missed Part 14 because you got through like the first 20 minutes and then you were like, this is really boring, then you're going to not understand the entire rest of what we're doing because it just won't make sense. That video is so, I'm gonna call it critical to understanding everything we're gonna be doing that uh, if you don't watch it, you won't understand the importance. Um, so you're gonna need to watch it again if you didn't. And if you did watch it and you're really grasping what I'm trying to say in there, it'll only get clearer and clearer if you're not quite understanding what I'm trying to say. Um, I'm making these videos in such a way, right, that you can think about this stuff a little bit. If someone handed you a golden platter with everything on it, you would probably waste it. That's why some people who win the lottery are actually the poorest people ever because they don't know how to handle such a good thing. So the best way is to give them a little at a time and teach them how to use it responsibly. And this is how I'm doing with you guys with these videos. I'm trying to give you the pieces you need so that you can understand this stuff. As you think about it, you can grasp what you're looking at and not just throwing it in your face because then you won't understand it. So the important part of teaching is making the person think and answer the questions, not just hand them the answers. This is the Search for Answers video series. I'm searching for answers. When I find an answer, I'm teaching you and making you search for the answer. Um, some of it I'm just giving to you and other stuff I don't have answers for. And some of it I'm making you understand it through thinking on your own. So that is why these videos take such a long time. So now I'm gonna quit talking and I'm gonna try to get to what I'm trying to say. I have a new setup here. I have a small whiteboard and I think I have enough room to stand on either side and sort of talk to you. Um, and I'm not sure about the light and the reflections and everything. I tried to drown out some of this. So let me know what you guys think in the comments if uh, I need to try to figure out a different situation here if this is okay. So uh, in the last experiment on number 14, I talked a lot about Newman's theory. Now, why did I do that? Why did I bring up Newman's theory in there? Because some people just despise the theory for some reason and other people didn't even give it a chance and other people just ignore it. Um, I am not saying that if you don't understand what Newman says, you won't understand anything else. And I'm not saying Newman's theory is the only way that this is gonna work. What I'm saying is Newman gave us a theory that's so clear and direct, okay, and he wrote it in his book and he shared almost everything that he could and piled it in that book so clearly to his understanding. And he gave us a mechanical field theory. Okay. And if you understand the theory of what he's trying to say, then the rest of it is pretty simple. You can just kind of grasp what's going on. And the also really important thing is, is this theory was generated upon simple bench experiments, such as the ones that I did last video. And then the theory was built, and then a patent was written, and a patent was given to the patent office, and the patent attorney, um, I don't know how this exactly went, but the patent attorney told Mr. Newman that he must build the device, because he never built it. He just said, this is the theory, and I know how it works, and I know it will work. So Mr. Newman built a motor, a prototype, a generator, whatever you want to call it, a Newman motor, an energy machine. Okay, he built this after the patent. So he wrote the patent and you can go back and you, you can look at the patent, you can see what he knew and what he didn't quite know and some phenomenon that happened afterwards and you can get a guideline of time of when events happened. And you realize that his theory gave him such clarity of what he needed to do that he went and built a ridiculously large motor. I mean, the thing was four foot tall, four foot in diameter, 
Um, according to some new information I found, it had 9,000 pounds of number five copper wire on it. And it had uh, 700 pounds of magnets. I mean, who in their right mind builds a prototype this big and Newman clearly understood that he needed to build it to that scale to have no questions that it's going to work as described according to his understanding his theory so the point of me telling you this is I'm not pushing Newman's theory at you so that it's like the you know the slapstick it's the only thing that you get no you don't have to buy hold by all those but it is very important to at least go through it and go through it with an open mind so you can understand all the things I'm about to tell you what I've already told you and what we're going to get into into the future. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on to what I want to talk about in this video. So this is a bit of a mess today. I'm going to talk about one very uh, critical thing that I think is important that I've talked about before, but I'm going to tell you a little bit different um, viewpoint on it. Uh, so let me go through my notes. Um, okay, so... Right, so the point of last coil, okay, and the point of what he's trying to teach you, Mr. Newman, is that it makes you understand the basic fundamental interaction between a wire and a magnet, okay, and a coil and a magnet. And that is basically critical, and he does it in a mechanical way. So that's, that's the reason. I'm a mechanical-minded guy. So you got to remember, I'm an electromechanical minded person. You throw a bunch of electronics at me and yeah, I'll figure it out eventually, but it's not my expertise. Um, you know, I like doing physics. Remember, we're doing physics here. I'm not an expert at physics either, but I know enough to look at what is going on around me and realize that some things just don't make sense. Let's go back to the basics and look at them. And that's what we're going to, that's what we talked about in the last video. So in this video, I'm going to go back to a question that I don't believe anyone answered and it was a very simple question right if I have a battery and I have a switch and I have a coil yeah we're gonna call I probably got this backwards but um, well it doesn't matter right now it does matter I'm gonna call I probably got these, I don't know, see this is how bad I am, I don't even know which one is positive or negative when you draw a battery with short and long lines, so don't feel bad if you don't know all the details. Um, some of these symbols I don't have memorized, but anyway, for the, for, the, for the sake of this video, this is going to be negative and this is going to be positive, okay? So current, according to what we think we understand, flows in this direction. Now, if you flip the switch down and current flows in this direction and then you turn it off, okay? If you turn it off, if you disconnect the switch before this current gets through the coil, what happens? This is a question I've asked a hundred times. What actually happens? Now, I'm bringing this question up and I'm going to say what I'm saying right now because I think it's important. I came to this conclusion of this question on my own terms, on my own experiments, on the bench. And then I realized about a month later, and you can go back in the timeline and look. Well, you won't know when I read Newman's stuff, but I read it about a month after I asked this question. And as I'm reading through that, I realize that he asks the same question. He asks exactly this question. And he writes in there, and he describes what he thinks, and he shares you what he thinks. And I thought that was fascinating, because I have not seen this question posed anywhere, and yet Mr. Newman actually had it in his book. It's written in there. And I came to this question before I wrote that, I, I read that, I read that information. And it's just, it's very fascinating to me that this is an important piece of the puzzle. And it's a question I had dear to my heart well before I realized he wrote about it. So what happens here? Well, there's a bunch of things to think about. You guys remember the video. I don't even remember the number. The one, I think it was, might have been 12. I think video 12, I think, I don't know. But it's the one where I talk about induction in a coil, right? And if you get so much induction, right, you get a water hammer, um, back EMF, you have counter EMF, you have something acting as, an, as a closed-ended pipe, which would be this situation, and you have all these things going on. Um, and if you 
need a refresher, go watch that video, then come back to this one because this points out some more additives to that. So what happens? Um, I'm not even sure you could answer this question except for one thing I can tell you. A lot of people think that this is instantaneous and um, Kirchhoff's law holds to this, but it doesn't. It does not hold to this at all. It completely violates it. Uh, and, and so do a lot of other systems, and this is well known. But one of the important, crucial things here is this question might not be able to be answered, but what can we answer? We can answer one thing. What is the speed of propagation of current through a wire? Okay, and it is the speed of light. I'm not going to write it down. It's the speed of light. Now, that's in a vacuum, so that's in free space. So. Current travels down a wire at the speed of light in free space, but we're not in free space. We're actually in this big giant coil that you can barely see in the frame. We're, we're not in free space. We have a completely different reaction. And to test this, there's a video that I'm putting in the description, which I've already linked to in the past. You should have already watched it if you've been going through all my links. And it is a video about the propagation speed of current down a coaxial cable. And what you can do is if you have a coaxial cable, I need to get better markers for sure. When I get paid eventually next, I'll, <laughs> I'll get new markers. So if you have a wire and it's a loop, okay, and here you have uh, a termination resistor, okay, and then you have, this is a coax cable, right? So you have a shield right there. So you have the center wire, and then you have the, the shield of the coax, right? And you're going to be sending a square wave pulse down the center of this wire. And it's going to hit the resistor here. Okay, and you got to remember the it's also connected here through ground, but you're sending a signal in one, one wire. So technically this is just shielded, grounded. But if you're measuring, if you're probing here, Okay, and you're measuring the signal going out, and then you're measuring the ground over here, the signal going back, and this might not be the proper setup. What you can actually do is, if this is uh, 50 ohms, right, 50 ohms impedance, the coaxial, cave is the coaxial is 50 ohms impedance, and what you actually end up with is you end up with a transmission line. So we're jumping into transmission line theory. So the... Um, shielding of this cable, um, which is uh, to get the right impedance, to get the right 50 ohm impedance, between the outside and the inside is actually a dielectric. Usually it's like a Teflon or some other similar material. And it creates capacitance between here. So what you end up having is you actually end up having okay inductors and capacitors. So you have a short piece of wire, that's an inductor. You have a capacitor, uh, you know, that creates an LC circuit. So what you actually have is you, pro you propagate through this circuit. It's not just a wire. It's actually a capacitive inductive circuit. And what you can do is you can look at the signal coming back and you can see the reflection. So pretend like if we had a break right here, and you sent a signal in, it would reflect back here, which is open, which is not terminated at 50 ohms, and you would actually see that interference. And if you connected, if you connected that wire, then you would get back to seeing this 50 ohms. And if you change this uh, to, uh, well, 25 ohms, then you would see yet again a different change. Now, there's a video, I was going to do this on my bench and show it to you, but I thought, why would I do that when someone else explains the math, the theory, the understanding, and has a much better setup to do it? Why would I do it if someone else did it? Someone else did it. Link is in the description. It's crucial to understanding a delay line signal, coaxial signal, seeing how that works. And it's so clear, it's only about six minutes long. Well worth your watch. And if you don't watch it, then why did I tell you about it? I told you about it because you got to do your homework. This series of videos is about doing your homework. The search for answers. You got to find your own too, you know. 
So the reason I tell you this is because I really truly believe that by understanding this, you can grasp what I'm trying to say to you. And what I'm trying to say to you is that even though, okay, you have a wire and you're sending a current through the wire, like in this circuit, even though it's just a wire, right, you actually have capacitance and you have inductance and it's not in free space. So the propagation down a coaxial cable is somewhere on the order of 70% of the speed of light, not the speed of light. And then if you start adding in things like <clears throat> the impedance, so if you switch this at certain frequencies, this coil is going to impede, create a resistance higher than the wire resistance, and you will actually change yet again, and I believe this to be true, but you might prove me wrong, you will actually change this again. So instead of being 70%, it might be uh, 50%. Because the magnetic field induced in this coil is producing a slower speed. Even yet, even more than that, because again, 100% is in free space, 70% is because of the capacitance coupling and everything that's going on. So now you include this in a coil and you have multiple things going on. Remember, what do you have here? Okay. This is, this is an ideal component as just purely uh, an ideal coil, right? Remember? Okay. An ideal coil has just purely resistance, but this coil actually has capacitance between each winding. And if you remember, I talked about self-resonant frequencies, and I talked about the curve, you know, and I talked about going up at a peak, and I talked about it going down at a peak, and here is uh, L is inductance, so you have inductance, and when you hit this peak of resonance, then everything over here, um, let me draw a C for capacitance, it's not the right is anyway, C for capacitance, and then most of the time, this is all you get. They say right here at this point is resonance. And it's the point where the capacitive reactance and the inductance reactance are equal, are equal, and you only end up with resistance. But if you're outside this window, then you have a lot more interaction going on. You have these capacitance to deal with. So anyway, the thing is, is there's a second half of this, which is what I talked about previously in a video. And this second half, this is also resonance. So in an inductor, you have parallel resonance, okay? So parallel resonance, all right, from the outside, all right, so let me show you. This is, actually, let's draw, let's draw this differently. Let's just make it slightly easier for us to understand. How does that blue look? I want to use colors that you guys can see well. The green seems better. So I'm going to, I'm going to just um, draw it like this. So an ideal, an ideal inductor has just resistance, but realistically the circuit looks like this. So let's say current is flowing through the circuit with these arrows. So realistically this is what you're going to see, and actually it's between each winding, but we're just going to see what we see. So, so if this is an inductor, then what you end up with is you end up with this peak right here is actually the resonance between the, the self-resonant frequency. Don't forget I'm talking about self-resonant frequency. If you physically add a cap, then you got to add the capacitance of the coil plus the capacitance of the cap, and that is actually where your resonant point is. So you can change the resonance by putting a cap on there. But anyway, right here, Okay, you get this reaction where from the outside, okay, a, a parallel resonant circuit like this actually acts, okay, here at resonant, this circuit acts from the outside. So if I was forcing current in where this arrow is, and this was at its self-resonant frequency right here, then this would actually just act as an open circuit. It would act as a capacitance. It would act as an open circuit. 
And in fact, the only, well, I won't get into that, but it acts as an open circuit. What does that mean? That means this circuit impedes, slows down, tries to stop the current flowing through the circuit. So now if I tell you over here, okay, if I tell you I turn on this switch, and I turn it on at a switch and I'm doing it many times, and I'm doing it at its self-resonant frequency, then this thing impedes the flow of current even more, which gives me even more chance of slowing the thing down, or shut, or I should say opening this before current gets all the way through it. So one thing they don't ever talk about though is this point. This point right here, something else happens. Okay, this is self-series resonance in, in an inductor. Now how do you have series resonance, especially self-series resonance, how do you have self-series resonance of an inductor when it's connected as a parallel circuit? Well, this is the one that kind of throws you off. In fact, the self-series resonance is usually to it an external source. In this case, we're going to say to ground. So from the coil to ground at some point, it will reach its self-series resonant frequency. And if you add, let's say, an aluminum case around this coil, you create what? Capacitance to whatever the case is connected to. So if the case, if the case is uh, connected to ground, then you're gonna actually have a, an, an effect. You're gonna put external capacitance on this system. So anyway, these principles I'm teaching you right now are mm, might not be used in this example that I'm asking you right now, but I wanted to bring this up while I was thinking about it. So here's the important part. If this circuit without this resonant point, at this resonant point, this circuit will act as an open circuit. However, the other way around, when you get self-series resonance, it acts the opposite. It acts as if it's connected. So it has a super low impedance to ground or to outside or to whatever its series resonance is connected to. So from the outside, and I don't want to really talk about this, but if you had a capacitor and you drew it for real life, you'd have to add resistance in here. But without that for the moment, this is where you'd get self-series resonance. So a capacitor has self-series resonance naturally. An inductor has self-parallel resonance naturally. And the important thing about this is this circuit acts as a short and this circuit acts as an open. Okay. So let's get back to our original question. which we are talking about what happens. Well, here's the thing. This is an extremely hard thing to measure, okay? And, um, induct yeah, so many things that come into play here. So an inductor is a current limiter, right? It's used as a current limiter via its magnetic field. So it opposes the flow of current. So that's why you see sometimes you see a big coil in like a welder sometimes or in a battery charger sometimes, like the bigger ones. And you realize like, what is this coil doing in there? It, it literally just, it's just a coil around an iron core and then it goes back out. And you're kind of like, well, it's only got two ends. What is, it, what is it doing? Well, it's actually trying to limit the current. And if you're pulsing such a thing super fast and it's in the right range of the window of that inductor, then you can actually do exactly that. You can slow down current going through it. Now, does that change the propagation delay of the speed of light? Does it, does it change the velocity factor? I'm not 100% sure, but I would expect it to, yes. So that's my answer for now. Um, okay. So I'm going to read you a... Um, 
Actually, I'll read this. Uh, remind me. <laughs> remind me. Yeah, remind me in the comments to read this after I'm done. <laughs> um, all right. So really, I only got one more note in there, and I'm going to say it after this. So now what I'm going to, what I'm going to, I'll leave that there. What I'm going to talk about is, let's say I was going to really set up this experiment, and I was going to try to measure this. Now, the length of most wires, right, it's going to be like in the nanosecond range. So you're going to have to switch this at nanoseconds. Now, if you switch such a thing in, in, as an AC form, right, so a sinusoidal, sinusoidal wave, it, it doesn't really, it's not really helpful um, to this experiment. You have to do it as a brute force. Slam it on, slam it off. That's the importance of this water hammer effect that we are always talking about. So there is a difference between having AC in the coil and having a very sharp, very, very sharp DC pulse. And so actually you can't even get a, shoop, a super sharp DC pulse. That's the, that's the fault with some semiconductor technology is that you can't actually hard switch it that fast. So what's the best way to do it? Contacts, right? That's what's on this um, system that we're playing with now. It's contacts. That's the best way to do it. So actually I am going to erase this because I need to be able to write on the rest of this board. So we're going to try to pretend like we're going to set this experiment up for real. Um, I'm going to say that I've got current probes. You could also use a small resistance and measure the voltage across it. It's still measuring the current, but for the sake of me drawing this, um, I'm going to actually draw Okay, A for amps, negative and positive. Okay. And then I got the amps here. Now I'm going to draw a pretty big coil because I'm going to tell you something that's important. So I have a really, really large coil, like the one that's sitting right next to me, right? That thing weighs 140 pounds. Richard wrapped it by hand. It took him a long time. It's freaking awesome. Um, so, right now, we're measuring amperage at the negative and amperage at the positive. Now, where would we measure voltage? Well, across the coil, right? So, you'd be measuring... voltage right or e we're measuring voltage across the coil and we're measuring amperage right at two different locations and we're trying to say if i turn this switch on what's going to happen well here's the thing let's pretend we did not have a coil let's pretend we had a length of wire such as a coax we know coax has a propagation speed we can calculate the propagation speed they can even tell you where there's a break at in the line because of the reflection. And you can actually do the calculation. You can know exactly how many feet away from there with, a, with a, an oscilloscope and a signal generator. And you can go to that section where the, the break was and you can cut it out and you can actually physically get within feet of exactly what, where the break is. That's the way these um, network analyzers work. Some of these network analyzers that actually determine where a cable is broken and stuff. It's propagation speed, doing that calculation. So if it was just a length of wire, then we should see current flowing here, and then at some time later, current flowing there. But what are we going to see, and, and this may be very, very short, uh, in whatever length of wire. But let's say we have an extremely long length of wire. Let's make it uh, 100 miles of wire, okay? Then we're definitely going to see a propagation speed, even if it's short. We're going to see it, no problem. So we're measuring voltage here. Well, if we're measuring voltage here, then you're going to say, you know, a lot of people argue this point. It's like, and I, and I said this before, voltage is instant. Current is not. Why is that? Well, if I have this battery connected to this long length of wire, pretend this time we're just talking about a wire, to this long length of wire, and I'm measuring here, and I'm measuring here, okay, in fact... 
Let's measure in a different spot just for the sake of this argument right now. Okay, so I'm measuring across the battery and across the coil. So I'm connected like this. Then you'll say, um, uh, actually, I take that back. It's been a while since I thought about this, so forgive me. So I, I, I am going to measure across the coil. So right here. So you're going to ask yourself, well, when you flip the switch, you can measure voltage instantaneously, but current takes time. Well, think about it. When you flip the switch, where are you, what are you measuring? Right? This negative is already connected to here. So you're going to measure the source voltage because right now there's no... Um, this voltage potential as it sits is open to this long wire. But when you, when you connect it, you instantly have voltage because the voltage, right, is like pressure in a pipe. Um, if you pressurize a pipe, no matter where you cut the pipe, anywhere down the line, it's going to instantly have pressure. But the current, right, the amount of flow it takes for that water to get down the pipe is going to take time because of how the delay of propagation is. And it's, don't use that analogy too hard. I'm just trying to throw simple terms out for people to understand. But that's the idea. So you've al you're already measuring voltage there, so that's why it's in instantaneous. And a matter of fact, the voltage is going to be equal to the source when you actually do it. So if I do this circuit for real, I'm going to actually measure a delay in current. Yes, I will. You can go watch that video I told you to watch in the description, and you'll see exactly that you can measure it. You can't see it. No questions asked. So then you ask yourself, well, Okay, and the original question is, was what, it, what happens if you turn it off before current gets through the wire? You've already put current in the wire, you've already aligned the atoms to make a magnetic field. Remember, we covered that in one of the other videos. If you align the atoms, you're making a magnetic field. And if you're making a magnetic field, then you shut the current off before it ever gets to the circuit, then this battery shouldn't use any of that energy. It shouldn't, because it didn't make it through the circuit. It's not deteriorating this because it didn't get through there. Now, whether that's a true statement or not, I can only argue the point. But right now, logically speaking, it makes sense because uh, if you go back to Faraday's law, I'm tired. If you go back to Faraday's law of electrolysis, it says that the uh, breakdown of the material, right, is the consumption. You can do that calculation. And if the circuit didn't get made, then there should be no breakdown of material and you shouldn't actually be consuming any power out of here. So the question originally was how can you do it and you have to do it with nanosecond switching and that's not possible. So what do you do? You just get a longer length of wire. So in this case, we went with a longer length of wire. We saw a delay. So does it use power or not? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But what I can tell you is, is that's a really interesting question because then you come back to a coil. And you go, let's look at this situation in the exact same thinking. Ah, but what's different here? Remember, all this capacitance, okay? All this capacitance plays a role now. And not only the capacitance, but you also have what? You have induction. The induction is induced magnetic field. And then what does that mean, Russ? What are you really trying to tell me here? Well, I'm trying to say is that you also have, along with capacitance, when you're charging an inductor, you have an induced magnetic field, right? So if the magnetic field or the current is going in this direction, it's going to induce voltage and current into the other windings next to it. And if you think about it, if you ask the same question, what happens, okay, when you measure this now? And you're going to say, well, you know, current should be able to get through there at the same speed as which the coil length is. Except now you have induced currents. This is very important. Induced currents, right? Technically, you should see induction much, 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 much faster, technically more closely, exactly, more closely, but probably not all the way at the speed of light. Maybe, maybe it is. 
but you should see induction. So this winding induces current in this winding, which induce, is cur induces current in this winding, in this winding, in this winding. And actually, if I were to draw an arrow of the current, I should probably just draw it straight up. Oh, that was amazing. If I draw current right now, the induced current, okay, is gonna be way up here, but the current in the wire may have only made it a few loops, okay? Let's say it made it here, okay? So it only made it like halfway up. Well, guess what? You've also got capacitive current, and capacitive current is also going to be much, much faster than the propagation speed of the wire. So when you take the measurement, you're gonna go, well, I turned it on and I instantly saw current coming out of the other side. But there's a problem with that. The current that you saw was not the current that's still traveling down the wire, right? That propagation speed through wire is a lot slower than the propagation speed through the magnetic field or through the capacitive coupling of the coil. So even though you're measuring current over here, the question is, what current are you measuring? And then you ask yourself, well, if I shut it off as long as this propagation speed current doesn't make it to the circuit, then there's no, there's no complete circuit here. And, and, and this is where the argument of the conversation is going to start because let's say you're playing with really high voltages. Well, now, actually, this capacitive coupling could be real current traveling through the circuit. Those are real currents, right? And the magnetic coupling, right, is a, is a little different. But the capacitive coupling current could be real current. Now, if it's low voltage, then I would argue the point that, no, it's only inductive current that's truly getting through this thing, inductive current. So what does that mean? Well, let's draw it this way. If I apply enough current to only get halfway through the wire, wire and then I turn it off, well, guess what? there's still a bunch of current in the other half of this wire. Real current, current that you didn't actually pay for. It's in this coil. This is the whole idea right behind the bigger the inductance, the bigger the return from the coil. Well, why is that? The bigger the inductance, what does that mean? The more induced current into the coil, the more return from the coil as real current that you can get from it. So at some point, if you're switching this thing on fast enough, then you're only going to pay for, let's say, this much current, even though technically I just said you don't use any of that. Let's say you do use it. Ah, okay. Let's say it's only half, right? Well, actually, this is real current flowing in the wire. So if I disconnect this, right, and I would say, well, now this field is going to collapse and all the windings with current in them are going to try to go back down the wire. Well then technically, right, I get this current plus this current back from the coil. So now I just got an extra half or I should say an extra twice as much current as I put in coming back than I put in. So if this is one unit, now I have two units coming back, okay? And then if you add that, if you add this idea of induction currents that are real currents that you can get back from the coil, right? Put in X amount of current, get back twice as much current. How does that happen? Induced currents in the wire, because it's still real current. Now, you could actually test this idea you could say if this meter is reading twice as much current as this meter, because don't forget, this current is still gonna go through the wire because it's faster than, the, than this. So you may measure the same current going in here and you should be able to measure twice as much current coming back, okay? Depending on how this stuff is all set up, that's gonna be a hard, that's a hard experiment to do, which, I mean, ideally you could try it. And th these are things that are on my list of to-dos, but 
you know, there's so many uh, uh, to-dos right now. But if you add this idea of having this much current, and then you add the idea of video 14, where I explained very clearly that you could induce current, okay, into a coil while spinning a magnet in the same direction it wants to go, that means it's all aiding. Everything is helping each other, okay? Uh, that's all I really wanted to cover in this video, but I wanted to read this one quote directly from the book. This is from Newman's book. One should construct devices to use as little current as possible and practical in order to restrict that current from completing the circuit and returning to the battery or generator. If current is flowing, but not quite made it through the circuit, then reversed, it would now push the current back that was already trying to go back in the direction it came. Counter EMF and EMF and back EMF. Counter EMF, in my mind, is different than back EMF. I conclude back EMF as the water hammer effect, as the transient, right, as the low pressure. That is back EMF to me. Counter EMF is what he's saying. He's saying you have EMF going forward, you automatically have EMF going backwards at all times, no matter what. So if you shut off the thing before current gets through the circuit, and you have all this induction current, so you have twice as much current in total in the coil circulating as, as you actually put in, then you can get all this back out. That's what he's saying. Okay? So, I hope that either A, answers some questions, B, makes you think about a bunch more questions, or C, you got lost halfway through it, that you should watch it again. But I really hope that was beneficial for you. Um, I did not feel super prepared for this, so if it's a little fuzzy, I do apologize. But I hope it made sense to you, because these are some crucial, critical, basic, fundamental things that you should think about in order to develop and configure and make work a device such as this guy. All right. Um, so that's all I got for you. Um, I did want to mention one thing, which was I'm having a hard time making the search for answers and the Newman video series. I'm having a hard time. So I'm going to ask you if you made it all the way to the end, you're a dedicated watcher. And I'm going to ask you a simple question that I want you to answer in the comments, which is, um, do you want me to include Wednesday videos as Newman update videos? So I'll do the search for answers every other week, which would give me more time to make better content for these videos. 
and then I'll do a Newman update, update video on Wednesdays. That'll give a little flexibility. Um, Saturdays, I'll be uploading a video no matter what. It may not be related or it may be related to this project or something else. Um, but Saturday, I'm going to upload a video and Wednesday, I'm, I'm, I'm going to upload a video. And that gives me a little bit free time in between there to actually think about what I'm going to make and what I'm going to present to you. So let me ask the question again. Is it cool with you guys if I put the search for answer videos on Wednesday and then every other Wednesday I'll have a Newman update video and then Saturday will be either a Newman update video or something else but Saturday you'll have a content Wednesday you'll have some content let me know what you think about that idea um, I'm not going to stress my myself out but I like to hold my feet to the fire and make myself make these videos even when I'm not really prepared I sat down I think Monday and just wrote this stuff down and then today I spent half the day um, um, going through a bunch of information, re refreshing what I wanted to say, and then, you know, be able to make this content for you. But it's important because I don't want to be standing on the top of the mountain yelling back at you and you're confused. I don't want that. I want you guys to understand what I'm presenting, what I'm asking, what I'm telling you, and not be confused so that you're on the mountain with me right and not down below going what did you say I don't understand man I don't want that I want to bring you with me on this journey and make you understand this stuff so if you're not understanding it and I'm not getting it across let me know last video was very clear I think some of the other videos not so much uh, sometimes I just bring you thoughts and ideas which are important to think through the process so that's all I got for you God bless read the Bible more it will be helpful, I promise. And I'll see you guys next time, whenever that is. Probably Wednesday. I mean, you'll see me Saturday most likely. But Wednesday for sure. All right, bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. rwgresearch.com. I have not updated anything on there in a while. So if there's a volunteer out there who wants to help me keep that updated, let me know. God bless. Bye-bye.